Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's ISDVS Terra Mechanics Byte um, digital event series. Today, we have Mr. Carl Becker, uh, a PhD student at the university, as well as a researcher at the University of Pretoria. Um, he's going to present his work uh, for his PhD dissertation on um, thesis, excuse me, on parameterization of tires with large lugs. Um, just a few things before we kickstart the session. Um, I would like to uh, point everyone to the right hand side of their screens. You will see there's a Q&A tab which you can use dur during the session to type in your questions that you might want to ask Carl Becker. Uh, at the end of the session, we will also have a few minutes um, time so that you can ask questions live on the session. Uh, to do that, after the session, you can click on the blue share audio and visual button. Then you can ask your questions live if you wish to. And also a last thing that I would like to point out is during the presentation, if you hover over the presentation, you will see there are three dots within. You will find an option to make the screen full screen if you would like to do that. So without further ado, Carl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me, just uh, confirm. Yeah, we can hear you. Awesome. Right, so uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, good day <laughs> to everybody uh, listening to this presentation. Um, it's so nice to have uh, a big uh, audience uh, for the session, and I just need to now get my... Uh, Good to to share my screen. I don't know where that Andres that has disappeared now. Where did that go? Sometimes that happens. So um, unfortunately, the easiest way is to just refresh your your page. Um, come back on the session. Here we go. Uh, this one. And we're off. Awesome. Right. So let's start. With... <laughs> okay. So today we will be talking about um, the parameterization of tires with large lugs. Now, why large lugs? Is because uh, not a lot of people can do it. Um, large lugs are. Uh, a very small uh, market, so um, the general passenger car industry uh, don't really cater for that. Um, so, if you are living in the city, you have a, a small chance of getting to drive, getting the opportunity to drive past um, an agricultural vehicle or construction vehicle, for that matter. The closest you'll get is um, driving past them on the back of a truck. Or if you live in a slightly more rural area. Um, you you might uh, drive past them when they are um, driving to them between fields, or you might even get stuck behind them. And if politicians and farmers get upset with one another, uh, there's a big chance that you'll see a lot of them on the road. Um, the big the big thing with these uh, vehicles are that they actually are also involved in uh, vehicle accidents. Now I'm not saying at all that. Uh, these vehicles cause these accidents, but it is important as a designer uh, of these vehicles to um, enable these vehicles to be able to stop in a safe distance and also to be able to make or take uh, evasive maneuvers uh, to avoid these accidents. Now, there are enough accidents um, in Europe um, to have the German Insurance Association set up and do an investigation on this. And they found that um, most of the accidents are turning accidents, crossing accidents, and um, tractors involved in longitudinal traffic accidents. So it's def definitely um, a bit of concern that these tractors or vehicles are involved in so many accidents. Now, these tires are not cheap, uh, and running costs on tractors are, are getting higher and higher every day. Um, so these these tires are used until they are nice and smooth and bold, and uh, 
that will uh, wreak hav havoc on your um, on the handling of the tractor. Uh, this is a typical example of uh, a tractor in use. And you can see, if you look closely, that the tread on the two front tires are not the same. So I really don't want to um, have to make an emergency stop with this tractor on, on these slippery conditions. Um, if, you're, if you're a farm owner um, and a, or a tractor operator and your tractor needs to uh, transverse between fields on public roads, uh, you can opt for uh, a tire similar to a Michelin Evo Whip, which is a nice tire because um, it can operate at two inflation pressures. Uh, you can run at a high inflation pressure when you're driving on road, and that will use um, a smaller contact patch. Uh, and if you want to use it in the field, you deflate the wheel and you get a bigger or a larger uh, contact area, which is good for the ground and good for the vehicle's flotation over a soft surface. But if your vehicle is used primarily on asphalt, asphalt roads, you can opt for uh, a road burp tire. Now, the, these are just two tires from Michelin. Uh, other uh, tire manufacturers have uh, similar products available. Uh, now, what's nice about these tires are they've got a lot more rubber in the contact patch. So that's good for the end user, but that is problematic for the designers as more rubber means more traction means a bit of a headache for the drivetrain designers. Um, so yeah, better grip does put a lot more strain on the uh, drivetrain of these vehicles. So in the design process, new technologies have um, assisted uh, designers in um, shortening the design cycle. Um, if you do a simulation, you can find out problems and smooth them out before you build any prototypes. Thus, you need to build fewer prototypes. Uh, but the one important thing that uh, young designers or engineers need to know and older engineers need to remember is that simulation is nothing like recycling. Uh, if you do recycling, you give it a bunch of garbage and you get a, a usable product out. Whereas on simulation, um, garbage in is garbage out or sometimes a lot more garbage out than you put in. Um, so your results in simulations are only as good as your input data. And this is a very important aspect to remember. Uh, simulation models normally use um, tire, uh, tire data uh, gathered from new tires. Uh, but if you look at the, the previous tractor, um, how does that tractor uh, react on smooth or used tires compared to a new tire? So we'll definitely ask the question of how do tires, tire characteristics change as the tire wears, especially on agricultural tires with these large lugs. Uh, now, you have different methods uh, to characterize tires. You can either do field tests on deformable terrain or non-deformable terrain. Uh, we'll be focusing on non-deformable terrain in this presentation. And you can also use indoor laboratory tests where we have, uh, where you can use a drum test rig or a flat track. And the surfaces on these um, test rigs can also differ. It can either be aluminum drums or steel, um, steel tracks. And sometimes they even put some um, uh, safety walk down to give it a bit more traction. Uh, but an, another question can be asked in the form of uh, how do these field tests and laboratory tests compare? Because the constraints are different and the surfaces are different. So that's an important, uh, important, important question um, to look at when you look at uh, vertical, longitudinal and lateral characteristics and also when you look at motion resistance and damping. So to do tests in research or any other environment, um, you need test equipment. Uh, and over the last 12 years, uh, the Vehicle Dynamics Group at the University of Pretoria has designed and manufactured a unique set of um, test equipment that we use for tire parameterization. Uh, one set of these test equipment is uh, wheel force transducers. And we have a variety of them ranging from a small one that can fit into a 10 inch wheel can carry a load up to eight uh, kilonewtons. And we also have a larger variant that can carry um, 30 or 300 kilonewtons and fits into a nine, 29 inch wheel. Uh, the ones we use the most are the 16 inch rim. Um, and that fits typically on a, a SUV. And the second one we use a lot is the 20 inch that um, normally fits on a commercial truck. So these are very important tools we have. And um, they integrate with all the other equipment that I'm going to show uh, in the next slides. 
And now we've also developed um, a static diet test streak that can uh, parameterize um, the vertical, lateral, and longitudinal char characteristics of a tire um, up to a tire with a diameter of four meters. Uh, now at this stage, we'll have to increase the size of our door to get it into the lab, but nothing's, nothing's impossible. Um, how this setup works is we've got a large actuator on the back of this road plate. Uh, we apply vertical load to the tire. And once that load is applied, we can either move um, the road plate in a lateral direction or a longitudinal direction while all the time measuring all the forces and moments. Now, what's nice about this rig is we can actually quite easily change the, the friction surface that we test on. And you'll see that that is um, a rather important um, property to have when you do tight tests. Um, a third important uh, piece of test equipment is our dynamic tire test trailer. Uh, this trailer can test rolling tires uh, with a diameter, um, a rolling radius of 400 millimeters up to a, a rolling radius of 1.2 meters. Uh, on this trailer, we can um, measure the side, side, side force slip angle. We can conduct side force slip angle measurements and we can control the vertical load on it up to a vertical load of five metric tons per wheel. And we can also apply the brakes so that we can do longitudinal um, characterization tests. Now, if, if we look at, this is a slightly older setup of this, this trailer. Uh, if you look at this, you see this is a, a large tire that runs at a low inflation pressure and high vertical load. And you can see how much the tire deforms um, when we are actually um, generating the lateral load. The tires are male because they cannot multitask. Uh, you'll see that the, it can either um, generate a maximum long lateral force, and when you start to apply the brakes, it can only apply um, a maximum longitudinal force. So this is very important to remember. Uh, if we look at a, um, a, a larger um, construction type tire, these tires run at a very high inflation pressure and also very high loads. Uh, so in general, these tires, on these tires, the um, sidewall stiffness is a lot higher. Uh, so it's not, it's impressive to see when you test these, but not as, not as nice as the, the lower inflation pressure tires. Um, the third and final nice or fourth, nice uh, piece of equipment that we've, um, we've manufactured is a damping test trailer. Uh, which we can also use to measure uh, motion resistance. Now this trailer works nice for damping because it doesn't have any suspension on it and we can um, load ballast weight up to 10 tons, uh, which means five metric tons per wheel. So when we do testing on, with this trailer, we tow, tow the trailer uh, over a cleat at a constant speed, say 10 or 40 kilometers an hour, depending on the wheel. Um, we measure the response, the vertical response um, that we get from uh, this trailer as it uh, drives over the cleat. Uh, for motion resistance tests, we have an instrumented um, instrumented towage uh, because the the longitudinal force you measure for motion resistance tests are a lot smaller than uh, the vertical load on the wheel. So in general, wheel force transducers. Uh, does not really um, have the best accuracy to do this, especially um, tires with large lugs and very stiff tires that see a lot of vibration. Um, so we found that these, this, this trailer works very well for measuring motion resistance. So if we go to the following one, the, t the tire of interest. So very important, why, we, why did we choose this tire? It's a 16 inch, 16 inch um, tire that we use um, on an agricultural vehicle. Uh, we simply use this tire because it makes the logistics to do this kind of research a lot easier. Uh, in future, I would like to do the, the same kind of tests on a larger set of tires. So if anyone wants to have that done, please let me know. Um, so first of all, we did test on this tire at 200 kPa and 80 kPa. And also we did three um, tread conditions as 100% uh, tread condition like this, where the, the tread depth is in the order of 30 millimeters. That's three zero millimeters. 
And then we did a test, a set of tests at 50% uh, tread, treadwear condition where we shaved half of the tread off. So that's 15 millimeters less. And then we completely removed all the tread from the tire. You can see how, um, the effect this amount of rubber has on the weight of the, of the tire that we, um, as we remove it. So a tire alone with no rim weighs in the order of 24 kilograms. And once we have removed all the tread blocks, it's only 15, uh, 16 and a half kilograms. So that's quite a significant change in weight. So if we start with the vertical characterization, uh, we'll start with tests on the static rig. First of all, uh, once you, if you, if you are parameterizing um, a physics-based tire model such as F tire, um, it's always good to do your uh, footprint uh, with the same during the same test as you do your vertical characterization tests. That ensures that the applied load um, is synchronized with um, the, the footprint that you get for that load. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we physically paint the, the wheel with um, some, some paint, black paint, and we press the wheel against a piece of white paper. For these tests, we also looked at uh, the pressure, trans uh, pressure distribution. And for that, I would like to thank Professor Vainan Stein from the uh, Civil Engineering Department at the University of Pretoria for giving me access to his tech scan system. So if we look at the size of the footprints, we can see that the, the footprint change quite a bit during um, the inflation pressure changes. Uh, but the most and significant change is when we uh, take all the tread off the, um, the tire. Uh, the actual contact area increased by uh, in the order of 200%. And that is because, um, well, there's a lot more rubber in contact in the contact area. Uh, especially on our asphalt terrain, uh, this will make a huge difference in the friction that you can generate. Um, that's probably why a lot of tractors run with bolt wheels on asphalt, <laughs> so that they can actually stop. Uh, if you look at the pressure distribution, you'll see that you have some spots that get tight um, pressure spots uh, when you have a, a brand new tire. And if you have, look at the 50% tread condition, you'll see that the, the lugs are a bit wider in the contact patch. And that's just because the, uh, the lugs are tapered. And then you'll see that the pressure distribution is a lot lower uh, when you've taken all the trade off, but that's just because you have the same force that you distribute over a larger area. Now, if, if you want to have a simple and easy simulation model, a uh, simulation tire model, you can, you can get away with uh, a linear approximation for the stiff, uh, vertical stiffness. As you can see, uh, this, this dotted blue line here will um, come up in a few slides, and that is just the static, um, static load that we tested the vehicles at, or the tires at. And so the, these sets of, of graphs are for 200, um, 200 kilopascal inflation pressure, and these set of graphs here are for uh, 80, 80 kilopascals. So you'll see that if, if you have a, uh, a linear static approximation for the for the vertical stiffness, yeah, you won't be far off. But that will only work if you are using it on a very smooth surface, which is never the case. If you start applying, um, the, uh, pressing the tire against the cleat, you'll see uh, for a longitudinal cleat that you get a, a, a stage, what we call a stage one stiffness, and then it translates to a stage two a stiffness. And that's simply because the tire deforms around the cleat. And as soon as the rest of the tire gets in contact with the flat surface, it goes back to the original stiffness um, on, a flat, on a flat plate. Uh, this is the same for if you look at um, the lateral cleats, you'll get a distinct kinked when the tire is deformed around the, the cleat, and then it gets the same stiffness as for a flat surface. Now, this is all done for a single inflation pressure. If we look at what happens when you change the, um, the inflation pressure and we change the tread condition, you can see that this transition point uh, moves as you remove the lugs, now, which makes sense because the tire deforms in a different way if you remove the lugs. Now, we had a question and we contemplated how can we predict this transition point? 
we play around with a few things and we saw that if we simplify the the all the all the lugs in the in the contact patch to one lug with the same um, dimension as the current lug on the tire and we make the base the same length as the, um, the distance between the lugs and we keep the width the same as the tire width we can actually approximate uh, this transition point um, by using um, deflection theory uh, from a simply supported beam and if we use uh, a third of the static load we can predict uh, where the transition point will be for the lateral cleat and if we use a quarter of the static load um, we can predict where the longitudinal transition point will be and by doing that we were able to get within eight and a half percent of uh, the transition points which is interesting because uh, it might help if we look at um, uh, longitudinal characteristics we we tested this um, in the field with the use of the um, damping test trailer where we physically lock the wheels and just drag the trailer forward <laughs> while measuring the displacement and the forces applied to the wheels um, this we did for multiple surfaces and then we did the same um, on the static test streak where we applied the vertical load and then moved the the, the red plate in the uh, the longitudinal direction now because we can change the surface on the road plate uh, we just we did that and we made a mold of the belgian paving at our test facility at geretic and we we made a casting of that molding concrete so that we can have the same um, input structure on the surface to the tire now if we look at um, all the different um, surfaces we tested on we can see that the uh, torsional stiffness of the tire, tire is 100% independent of the surface that you test on, which is nice. However, we can see that the, um, the friction coefficient that we get is totally different and 100% dependent on the surface that you test, uh, which makes sense because if you have a piece of road, it will give you one friction coefficient and if you put ice on it, it will have the same profile but it will be super slippery so you'll have a, a much lower um, friction coefficient so this is something very important to consider when you're doing uh, field tests and laboratory tests uh, so if we look at what happens uh, to the characteristics when you we remove all the tread again we can see that the torsional stiffness remains the same however the friction coefficient that you generate is completely uh, dependent on the surface this line here is the uh, the reaction of the tire from the field test where we had the wheels locked on the damping test trailer and we can see that the uh, torsional stiffness correlates rather nicely to the um, static test in the lab however the change in friction coefficient that we get um, we suspect is due to the boundary conditions um, because on the static rig you have a tire mounted on a pedestal and that tire cannot move in any direction whereas on the uh, damping test trailer yes you apply a vertical load on it with some ballast weights but you can get load transfer and the tra trailer can actually um, move up and down as, as you are dragging it but in general these results correlate very nicely so with the um, surface texture in mind we really need to look at that to be able to actually compare the laboratory test and the field tests accurately so if you look at terrain models um, you can get um, different wavelengths that um, that are captured within a, a profile of a terrain uh, now the one they are divided into three regions and the first one is a mega texture or your mega texture that ca covers um, a wave link from 50 millimeters to 500 millimeters and if you look at this graph you'll see uh, that that typically um, affects your right right quality or your right comfort if you look at the macro texture that covers a range from 0.5 millimeters to 50 millimeters and that typically um, affects the noise that your tire makes as well as the wet weather friction coefficient but if you go to the micro texture which is less than 0.5 millimeters you'll see that that contributes to tire wear and also determines your dry weather friction 
And this is important to know. Now, how do you measure microtextures? Microtextures of literally micro millimeters that you measure. Um, so this is a, a portable um, a surface roughness tester from Mutituyu. And if we, that is placed on an asphalt road that we wanted to uh, measure. And if we zoom into the stylus, we can see that the stylus is literally measuring the, the surface texture of the aggregate in the terrain which makes sense because the aggregate is your dominating factor uh, in your friction um, friction generation uh, component. So what we did is we took a template of the um, contact patch. Uh, we, we identified 21 points and then we measured these 21 sections on the road and got an average. Now this is typically the values that you get. Um, the calibration surface of uh, this uh, Rough surface roughness measurement tool is 2.94 micrometers. But what does that mean? Um, everybody's got a cell phone. So uh, if you if you touch your yourself your mobile phone screen, that is typically that will give you a roughness of 0 0.009, whereas paper is 2.78. Um, so what still what does that mean? Uh, if that you compare that to asphalt, asphalt is in the order of um, 8 to 12 microns. Um, but that's again difficult to, to comprehend what that physically means. So if you if you look at what the um, I hope everybody's touching their phones and playing with paper to get a feel for what it feels like. It means I've still got your attention. Um, so if you look at the profile, uh, again you'll see that a very um, coarse sandpaper will have lots of peaks and lots of valleys. And a piece of glass will literally be a straight line if you profile it. Uh, the calibration tool um, is a sonusoidal wave, and that gives you the, the 2.94 uh, micro, micrometer um, average. So again, this is nice to see, but how do you compare them? Uh, the best way to do that is if you transform those profiles to the frequency domain, and you look at the spatial frequency of these terrains. Now in simulation, um, you typically have a terrain that you import into your simulation model on which your vehicle drives. And that typically only captures the mega texture. So that explains why in simulation models, you will never be able to just drag in a, um, a terrain profile and get the correct friction coefficient. Um, so that's why it's very important to have your tire capture that data um, when you do simulation models. Now, for terrains, you can use the ISO 8608 standard and you can um, classify the condition, or not condition, the roughness of your, your terrain. Uh, roughness can be from uh, a class A road up to a class H road, where a class A road is a nice smooth runway and a class H road, um, a very, very rough terrain. Now, these, if you have a nice random road uh, on the log log scale, you'll, you'll get a nice a straight line and that line extends through the, the macro texture. However, the Hirsch's exponents um, has indicated that that changes angle when you get to the micro texture. And that is just what we saw um, when we did our measurements. Uh, now, the best way to, to compare these is a similar method as a road index, what we call a surface index. And that is a value you get at uh, 75,000 cycles. And if that value corresponds to your field surface and you use that uh, value on the surface you use in the laboratory, there's a very good chance that your uh, friction coefficients will line up. And that was good to know. So we did a bunch of tests on uh, different inflation pressures and different trade wear conditions. And we saw that on smoother, um, uh, smoother surfaces, we get quite a large scatter of friction coefficients that you generate. And if we go to a very coarse sandpaper, we also get a large scatter. So it is super important to have a, um, an artificial surface in the laboratory that corresponds to the uh, actual field in which the tire is going to be used. Uh, so enough on uh, um, surface texture and surface roughness. Let's start looking at um, uh, test results. So 
we know it's important to have uh, the right surface. Uh, so let's let's stay with one surface for now and only change the vertical load. So if you change the vertical load during the longitudinal characterization, you see that the torsional stiffness decreases for the specific tire as you increase the load. And that's just because you're deforming the lugs. With that said, uh, if we keep the load, the vertical load constant, and we change the tread condition, we see also very interesting results uh, in the form that for 100% tread condition and 50% tread condition, you get a very similar um, torsional stiffness on the tire. And you can also generate more or less the same friction coefficient, but that's just because the, um, the, the uh, contact patch is very similar. However, if you remove all the lugs, you get a lot stiffer torsional stiffness. And that is actually the uh, torsional stiffness of the carcass. And you get a, a very, very high uh, friction coefficient that you generate. And that's because you have a lot larger um, contact area. So that makes sense. That makes sense. And this is super important for physics-based tire models. Uh, for argument's sake, if you are, want to parameterize an F-tire model, ideally, we would recommend that you test for a 100% tread condition as well as a 0% tread condition. And then when you're building your model, you first use your 0% tread condition to, um, to get your torsional stiffness of your carcass correct. And once you've got that right, then you add the lugs and get, get your parameters adjusted so that you get the right um, final stiffness of the tire with the amount of tread on it. So this is a very important um, parameter. Now, if we if we do um, multiple tests at two different inflation pressures on the same surfaces, we see that yes, we get a bit of uh, a variation in the friction frequency, not frequency, <laughs> in the uh, uh, friction coefficient that we generate. But we also see that on a very smooth uh, piece of aluminium plate, we get a very high friction coefficient and we get a bit of a um, stick slip phenomena going on. And as soon as we change the um, the tread condition, oh no, this one, sorry. <laughs> this the, These tests are done at a low inflation pressure, which we, we saw the, um, the stick slip phenomena. And as soon as we increase uh, the inflation pressure, that disappears. So we, we started asking, why is this? And this can be explained uh, by looking at um, the physical tests. Uh, this can later be maybe used by with the use of uh, digital image correlation to automate the system. However, when we apply the vertical load and then apply the longitudinal force on the road plate, we can see that we get torsional, the torsional stiffness and torsional windup of the carcass. And on the lower inflation pressure, we get the same. However, the torsional stiffness is a bit lower. So we'll see a larger um, carcass windup and also the stick slip phenomena. But as soon as we increase the pressure, that stick slip phenomena disappears. And if you look at what the lugs are doing, you can see the lugs uh, deform quite a bit because the lugs are long. So if we have a look at what this data looks like, we'll see slight difference in um, torsional stiffness and some difference in the uh, friction coefficient. So if we go on, so what's going on, right? So what happens if we keep the inflation pressure constant, but we change the um, tread condition? Typically, we know that this one is going to uh, give us the stick slip from the previous test we showed. And this one, we'll see that the stick slip disappears. However, if you look at what the lugs are doing, this lug doesn't seem to be um, rotating as much as the 100% condition. No. So to analyze this a bit further, uh, we can um, have a reference line in red that represents the uh, constant um, carcass torsional stiffness, which is, a, which is independent of the um, um, percentage trade on the carcass and at a set uh, inflation pressure. And we can have a look at the yellow line. The yellow line represents um, the windup of the um, the lug, the base of the lug, um, before we start applying a longitudinal force, 
and where we look at um, how much the, the lug has rotated at the end of the um, um, force application. Now, if we have a look at that, you see the vertical load being applied. Um, these lines will deform as we apply the uh, longitudinal force to the tire. And you can see with the vertical load applied, that is basically the, the angle of the base of the lug. Now, this is a 50% tread, so we shouldn't, we don't expect any stick slip to occur. And then when we get to the end of the test, we can see that the lug has rotated quite a bit. I don't know if you can see the, the green and the yellow line, but that just gives you a reference of how much the lug deforms. Um, and you can also see that the red line lines up um, at 200 kPa for a specific angle. So if we look at uh, what happens to um, the base of the lug at 0% tread, we can see that um, the lugs, the base of the lug doesn't re rotate as much uh, because there's no tread block that can rotate it. That's just uh, the carcass wind up that uh, rotates the base slightly. So there, the load's applied, and then we start moving the road plates in the longitudinal direction, and we use a train in the background to, to pull the, the road plates. Uh, right, so that goes up to the same reference line in the red. Because the inflation pressure is the same, that um, caucus deformation stays the same. Then if, yeah, that is that one. So then if we decrease the inflation pressure, um, we'll see that the carcass wind up is a lot more and the, the lug displacement remains the same because there's no uh, tread block to deform this lug. Now, if we want to um, explain this a bit more uh, mathematically, we have a bit of a solution for that. So there the tie comes up to the end of the, the track the test and you can see the dotted red line represents uh, the carcass wind up at a lower inflation pressure so there's definitely a, a change there so if we have a look at these results you can see that when you've got lugs on it the torsional stiffness as as a tire in a hole um, has more or less the same torsional stiffness but as soon as you remove the lugs you get different carcass stiffnesses for different inflation pressures which is understandable. Uh, so again, very important to use this data when you parameterize a physics-based tire model or an f tire model. So to put this on paper, <laughs> you can estimate or simplify uh, the lug and uh, to a counter beam, where the force applied is the force at the end of the counter beam, and you can um, you can detect the, or you can calculate the amount of deflection you can expect. And you can also, with a known force and the known tread depth, um, you can estimate what the uh, reactive moment is going to be that the carcass will need to have to keep the, the lug in position. So when you have a long lug, this moment is huge that's being applied. And the carcass is not strong enough to keep it there. That's why you get the stick slip phenomena, because the 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 lug is being um, deformed, it loses contact and it jumps back. The lug gets deformed, it loses contact and it jumps back. Whereas if your tread depth is halved or lower, at some point uh, the reactive force from the carcass will be high enough uh, to keep the lug in position. That's why you don't get the stick slip phenomena. So if we have a look at um, characterizing the lateral characteristics, you'll see that you get an unsymmetrical um, characteristic when you have lugs on the tire. And that's simply because if you look at the contact patch, you'll see you'll have more lugs on the one side of the tire and a few lugs on the other side of the tire. Now, as you index the wheel, this will change. And if you're running at um, the correct tire pressure, you might be able to get this um, uh, unsymmetrical effect almost symmetrical. Uh, which is not always possible. But as soon as you remove the lugs, you can see that you get a, a lot more symmetrical um, lateral characteristic. So to explain this a bit more, we can have a look at the video footage from, from a test like this. Uh, on this test, we apply a vertical load to the tire 
and then we move the plate outwards of the screen in a positive direction in the lateral direction. Once we do that, you'll see that the, the lugs phys physically lose contact uh, with the surface. So that means that these lugs here uh, have less pressure on it and sometimes even lose contact with the train. Uh, this is drawn over to this side of the, um, the contact patch and this lug here might get a bit more uh, contact but not necessarily and that creates the unsymmetric um, lateral characteristic. If you go the other way, you lose contact on the, this section here and you'll gain um, some additional um, load on this side but this is a lot more than that side. So that explains the um, unsymmetric lateral characteristic. If we go then to the dynamic tire test trailer, um, we can see that at a specified or predetermined slip angle, uh, your tire can either generate a maximum longitudinal uh, lateral force, or when you start to apply the brakes and the wheel locks up, you can only apply a longitudinal force. This is typical data from um, uh, a dynamic run. Uh, we try and use um, as unfiltered data as possible. Because once you start filtering data, um, you get um, a bit of a drift or you'll um, cancel out some of the dynamic effects. And on these big tires or large lug tires that have a lot of dynamic effects, you need to capture all of that. Uh, so again, we see that the longitudinal stiffness is nice and constant, and that's because of lugs. Uh, the, the torsional stiffness is nice and constant because of the lugs. And we have a slight change in friction coefficient, uh, and that's just because at a low inflation pressure, you have a larger footprint. Now, the lateral um, characteristics during a, for a rolling tire is quite interesting because we have an unsymmetrical um, lateral uh, characteristic on the static rig that is transferred to uh, the uh, rolling tire in the form of waves. So as the tire indexes, the amount of lugs in the contact patch change and that generates um, these oscillations. Now what we can see here is at a high inflation pressure, you get a high lo um, lateral load that you can generate. At a low inflation pressure, uh, you, you generate a lower load. And that's simply because uh, for a high inflation pressure, the tire is nice and stiff and it doesn't deform that much. So you, you, your lugs lose less contact, which is counterintuitive because at low inflation pressure, you have a slightly larger contact patch. But that is cancelled because of the tire deformation. If you look at the um, friction envelope, again, we see that you can have a larger uh, lateral load at high inflation pressures and you can have a larger longitudinal load at low inflation pressures uh, because of the larger footprint. And now these tests were all done at 100% tread condition. Um, hopefully I can get uh, some tests done uh, at the beginning of May and then we can do um, a 0% uh, tread condition then we'll have some more data to, to present. Now as I said before we would like to be able to compare dynamic tests with static tests. And to do that, um, you need to make some adjustments uh, to the data. So why do we want to do this? It's because um, dynamic tests um, are time consuming, expensive, and less repetitive than static tests in a laboratory, simply because you have weather elements and wear on, on terrain. Uh, we have limitations on tire size and loads that we can apply to the dynamic rigs. Uh, and that um, becomes a problem on um, construction tires and large agricultural tires. Uh, whereas on the static rig, we can have super huge loads without uh, any problem. On the dynamic rigs, we are limited to the load bearing capacity of the test axles. So if, if we are able to use static test results to parameterize um, a valid um, uh, tire model, this will reduce the cost of um, conducting these parameterization tests because you have less logistical issues. Uh, although, uh, as we've seen before, uh, we need to do tests on the 100% um, tread condition as well as a 0% tread condition. 
those additional costs are negligible uh, compared to the logistics addition in the uh, test costs for dynamic tests. So how do we do this? In order to compare longitudinal friction coefficient um, as a function of uh, percentage longitudinal slip during a dynamic test um, and uh, translate that to a static test where we have longitudinal friction coefficient as a function of longitudinal displacement. Uh, to do that, we translate um, the longitudinal slip in the contact patch uh, to longitudinal displacement. So to do that, we calculate the longitudinal displacement of the contact patch uh, relative to the um, displacement of the vehicle as you're driving during this um, slip period. And then we divide that difference um, by the amount of ro wheel rotations. And if we do that, we can get a typical graph like this, where we see that the static rig is the magenta and the cyan line. Again, at 100% tread, we get um, very similar uh, torsional stiffnesses because of the lugs. Um, on the um, static test with the damping trailer, uh, we can see that we get a similar torsional stiffness. And then uh, the black and the red line are uh, the data from the uh, uh, dynamic test trick. And again, the, the torsional stiffness at, in the beginning of the, of the uh, longitudinal slip test cor correlates very nicely to uh, the static tests. The friction coefficient, uh, as we've seen, is rather dependent on the, um, the surface you use, one, and two, the slight design uh, on the, the slight change in the constraints. But in general, it seems to be working. And if you look at the lateral test, uh, we need to uh, translate um, the friction coefficient versus uh, slip angle test to lateral friction coefficient versus a 90 degree lateral displacement. And that we can do simply by using trigonometry, uh, where you use the contact patch length and the set slip angle uh, for a specific position. And once we do that, again, we see that the um, static test and the dynamic test line up rather nicely. Uh, the one thing we've so, we've seen is that um, at a lower inflation pressure, the um, static test is not really representative of the dynamic test, but that is because the tire is rolling and as the tire rolls, it stiffens up slightly. Uh, but again, if you have a physics-based tire model and you use static test to characterize it, you should be a, um, you should be uh, okay with that. Uh, so we've seen that. Um, we can compare uh, static test and dynamic tests. And we've seen that static test, there is um, a distinct change in characteristics once your tire wears down to a smooth tire. Uh, so what happens when, um, what happens to the damping when your tire um, wears down? We did tests uh, with a damping test trailer. We would tow the, the trailer over a cleat and we measure the vertical response. Uh, then we take that vertical response and we um, use a logarithmic uh, decrement calculation to determine the uh, damping coefficient as well as the damped natural frequency. And if we look, have a look at these values, we'll see that the damping decreases by 39% uh, with a decrease in inflation pressure. And if you rem um, reduce the tread wear um, on the tire, you can get a 3% difference if you go from 100% to 50%. And you can expect a 12% change in damping if you go from 100% tread to 0% tread. Uh, and that is irrespective of the inflation pressure. And this rather correlates to what, what happens to the vertical characteristics of the tire. So what happens to the motion resistance if you change the, the tread condition? Um, we done a, we've done a, a very intensive study on determining uh, or measuring motion resistance. and you need to decide which uh, test you need to use. Uh, so you can use uh, ISO standards or um, S SAE standards, uh, but these are typically um, compiled for um, commercial trucks or even passenger car tires, where um, as in the case for a coast down test, you need, you need to drive the vehicle up to 115 kilometers an hour or something like that, and then have it coast down to 40 kilometers an hour. But this is problematic because uh, some of these uh, agricultural tires have a speed limit of 40 kilometers an hour. So you you need to adjust your measurement uh, method 
uh, for the tire at hand. Uh, we looked at jump tests, we looked at ghost down tests with a um, drive lane connected, and we looked at uh, drive lane um, disconnected tests, and then we also did a bunch of tow tests. Now, the, comp the results compared um, relatively nicely. However, if, if you want to do multiple tires or different tires, you need a different vehicle every time because not all tires fits on all vehicles. This is where the damping chest trailer works uh, actually very nicely because you can put any size wheel on it, uh, you can load ballast weights on it, and then you can just tow it. Now, these tests take some time to do <laughs> because uh, as you're not putting any um, braking force on the tire or driving force on the tire, they take uh, quite a bit of time to stabilize. And you can only use your motion resistance value once the tire is stabilized. And that can take up to four hours driving around in circles. Uh, but that was done. We did that for 100% uh, tread condition, 50% tread condition, and a 0% tread condition. And the results showed us that, um, yes, the motion resistance is uh, very dependent on the inflation pressure. So if you want to use less fuel, um, increase the uh, inflation pressure. And then we also found that um, between 100% tread condition and 0% tread condition, um, it can um, de the motion resistance can decrease by 23%. Uh, we expect that um, is due to uh, the lugs uh, pounding as as the wheel rotates, the lug come, comes down and it gets into contact with the road, and that absorbs energy. Uh, which in turn uh, increases your motion resistance. So if you have a tire with a lot of lugs in the center to reduce this um, log, um, lug pounding effect, uh, you'll have a lower motion resistance. Or as do some farmers do <laughs> and use the tires until they bolt. Um, so in summary, uh, we've seen that the vertical tire characteristics is very dependent on um, or is very independent on the surface texture, uh, but very dependent on the inflation pressure. Um, the tread, tread wear effects only comes into play um, when you drive over um, rough terrain uh, or the cleat in this, this sense. Uh, the stiffness change over the cleat can be estimated with the use of a simply, uh, simply supported beam approximation. Uh, when we look at the longitudinal characteristics, we see that it is super dependent on the test surface and the lugs decrease um, the, the torsional stiffness of, of um, the carcass and uh, as it acts as a spring that is in series with the carcass. Uh, for the um, lateral um, tie characteristics, we saw that again it's very dependent on the test surface and the lugs in the tread pattern um, affects the lateral characteristics in a way that it um, makes it a bit um, unsymmetrical. Uh, we also saw that um, we, it is able to um, compare the static and dynamic tests uh, at high inflation pressures. Uh, that is uh, the case for 100% tread condition. Uh, we will be looking into the 0% tread condition um, later in the year. And then if we look at the damping and motion resistance, we saw that for damping, uh, the inflation pressure is the dominating factor. And for motion resistance, um, we did see that the inflation pressure is, uh, is the dominating factor, and you can also reduce it um, when as your tire wears down. Now, all of this work um, is being published in the um, Journal of Tier Mechanics uh, in three different papers. Um, the first one being the effect of surface roughness on tire characteristics that has been submitted for uh, publication. Um, the agricultural tire stiffness change as a function of tire wear has also been submitted for publication. And then the uh, motion resistance measurements on large lug tires, which have already been published. So if you want to get a bit more um, um, info on this, uh, you can go and read up on that. Uh, in addition, we are also uh, willing to make th this data set um, uh, available as soon as I've done the 0% dynamic tests. So if anybody wants to use this data, just contact us and we can set up a Google Google Drive and share this information. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and open the floor for some questions. And if you're watching this later, you can always, always send me an email. All right, thanks, Gal. That was a very intriguing and interesting 
um, presentation that you have. So um, I, I invite anyone that would like to ask questions um, live to click on the blue share audio and video button. Then you can come on live to ask questions if you have anything or if you want to discuss something. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we have two questions. Yeah, two questions in the Q and A section. So, um, Carl, I don't know if you can see them or should I read them to you? I've got one question here uh, that says the coefficient of friction goes all the way to 1.8. That seems very high as compared to uh, other literature. And then they say, could you explain how such a high friction of coefficient is possible? Any comments from Michelin audience? Well, first of all, I think that one that went to um, 1.8 is on the, uh, what you call it, the Belgian paving. And that is typically because the, the lugs um, fall into the, the gaps between the bricks and then they physically tear over uh, and grab over the, the lugs uh, or, the, or the bricks. So that, that can be explained and that is, that is what we've seen before. Um, that's actually 1.4. I don't know where the 1.8 comes from. But this is definitely because the lug uh, falls into the gap between the, um, the, the, uh, the bricks and then uh, increases uh, the friction coefficient that you get. So as you see, as it climbs out of the, out of the hole or <laughs> uh, the gap between the bricks, the friction coefficient drops down to where if, um, it normally should be. Um, so we were not too worried about that too much. Um, the one we did have some questions about is the um, aluminium plate that gives you such a high uh, friction coefficient. But that is because the um, adhesion component is super high uh, on, on such a smooth surface uh, and also the lugs. <laughs> so another question was from Anonymous. Uh, it said previous, during the previous digital series event, Dr. Buerta saw uh, the use of cameras inside the tire. Did you use the same system in any uh, way on the work to present that we presented today? Uh, no, but that's coming. Um, I'm busy with some tests on the static rig, and as soon as that is done, uh, we plan to put the T2CAM system on the static rig and do a bunch of tests on that. So that is coming. Let's see, there's a new new question. This is, uh, Alex, can you please ask your question in person? That'll be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might, uh, Alex, on. Hi, Alex. How are you? Ah, hello. Hello, Carl. How are you? <laughs> Good, thanks. Nice to see you. Yeah, same uh, here. <laughs> th there is qu there's quite a lot of, of echo going on. I don't know whether it's um, uh, echoing around awesome. somewhere. I'm using Some... earphones and uh, the, 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 the laptop microphone, so I'm not sure if it's coming from me, but I did hear it before. So... Um, I'll, I'll carry on with the question and then be quiet. <laughs> so let's be quiet for a minute. And uh, look, well, the first one is: uh, Have you looked at all at large tire vibration behaviour and the effect of tire wear? Uh, I found that natural frequencies tended to be between about 1.4 and 3 hertz, depending on tire pressure, particularly. Um, and uh, I didn't look at tire uh, at, uh, lug frequency, but I suspect this is going to be a high uh, frequency vibration, which is may or may not interfere with uh, vertical behavior, uh, but maybe less with tire wear. Um, we've done um, model analysis on tires um, previously, and uh, well, not not on this tire, um, but on larger wheels, uh, you definitely um, see the tire starts to resonate when you when we're doing um, dynamic tests at a specific speed, close to ten kilometers an hour. The whole measuring axle starts to shake, um, which um, is a bit annoying because all that all of that is transferred to your <laughs> wheel force transducer data. So, yeah. Um, the lower frequencies are definitely a problem on, on bigger tires and on uh, any large lug tire because the, the weight is so far away from the center of the wheel, uh, any vibration will, will definitely have an effect. 
Okay, uh, I mean, the follow up to that is that uh, some time ago when I was looking at the, these problems, uh, one of the main ones seemed to be tire run out, in other yes. words, the oval effect yes. of the yep. rim. And when you go to a certain speed, you hit the natural frequency of the tire, which can yep. be quite disconcerting. Is that <laughs> something you picked up at all? Yeah, the radial run out we definitely see in the data. And uh, um, part of that, um, I think, um, adds to this this motion here. Um, because your tire is doing that, so your longitudinal force will also do that. Um, and then that's one of the reasons why we don't like uh, filtering our data too much. Uh, some people like nice lines. Yeah. We like the squibbly stuff because that means this all the data is captured. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, radial runout is is a problem, yeah, especially on these large tires because you can't balance them. Okay, there's a there's a lot to take in there, Carl. So hopefully uh, the audience will look at this video again and look at the papers to take more of the information in. So, yes, I, I struggled myself to condense this <laughs> and get get the sense essential stuff out. Um, yes, but I think the the most important the presentation. Is, it's been a, a lot of really useful stuff for for a lot of people to think about. Yes, I hope so. Thank you very much, um, especially for the F tire stuff. Um, to, uh, par parameterizing a tire with no lugs on it uh, to get your carcass stiffness uh, parameters tuned correctly. I think that will help a lot with. Um, with getting the FTI models going, because I know we've we've had issues in the past um, where we struggled to get get the FTI stuff going, especially in agricultural tires. Yeah, um, I know at the um, fifth um, FTI user conference, uh, Heinz did did do a a nice study with Fent, where they um, did a lot of tests in situ tests on the tractor uh, and parameterized the tire. But I think if we go this way, it might be a lot easier to, to get that par parameterization done. Okay, thanks. I, I, I'm not sure if you're hearing the interference, but I, I'll leave you back to Andres. And thanks for the input. Cheers. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, if there's anyone else that would like to still ask a question or type in their question in the Q&A, we still have a little bit of time left. Um, in the meantime, I have a more general question for you, Carl. So mm -hmm. how did you decide on doing this research for your PhD thesis? Like what was the, what was the big aha moment that made you decide to go into this? Well, there's a few. It started almost with my master's degree. Prof. Els will tell you that I was keen on not doing a PhD when I finished my uh, master's in 2008. Um, what we saw there is we um, we saw Prof. Els had a very nice model of the Land Rover that we uh, that is our test vehicle. And this model um, correlated extremely well on um, smooth terrain and, and obstacles, but as soon as we went on to rough terrain, we saw that um, the model just didn't correlate. Um, so then we we thought that the um, that the terrain was not the terrain profile we had was incorrect. So for my master's degree, we built uh, the CanCan -can machine and profiled all the terrains that we were interested in. But still, we got um, very limited uh, correlation on rough terrain. And then we looked at the Adams help file and we saw that the tire models could only give you um, vertical response up to 8 hertz. And at that stage, we thought, well, tire models have been sorted out. Why look into tire models? I mean, it's, it works. It's been here for years and years and years. Uh, but there's a reason why tires are black, because it's a bit of black magic. Um, so uh we've been looking uh, and developing all this test equipment for the last 12 years and originally i wanted to go in uh, and do um, some time measurements uh, um, in situ with the land rover um, but that is super difficult because uh, of all the load transfer when you're applying the brakes and doing maneuvers and that load transfer messes you around it's difficult to get that repeatable um, and then uh, we had a lot of um, motion resistance studies going on and um, we saw that um, 
the trade wear will definitely have an effect and we just took it from there and sorted all of this out. Um, I still have some tests that I would like to do. As I said, uh, I want to do some tests on larger wheels uh, and I also want to do uh, the 0% tread uh, on the current wheel. As soon as I have a gap, I'll, I'll definitely uh, get those done and then we can present those as well. So yeah, it's it's been a long time coming. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> um, then I have another question. It's kind of a, a follow up on, I think the previous question that was asked uh, from, from uh, Satya. So one of the um, pictures that you have, the one of the, I think it's on the P80 uh, friction, uh, um, sanding paper. Oh. We have a, a quite high friction coefficient there as well. Um, yeah. So, um, that was interesting to see, but that is because uh, if we look at the profile, uh, if you go here, uh, when you apply your uh, your wheel to the to the terrain, the profile physically f the rubber fills up all these gaps, and so thus you'll have uh, a lot of um, uh, adhesion as well as hysteretic um, friction component uh, that uh, contributes a lot to the friction that you get. Mm. So the more the and this tire is nice and soft. Uh, the rubber the rubber compound they use on this tire is a soft compound. So that uh, the rubber will definitely um, fall into all this all these valleys and peaks and just run away with the friction coefficient. Yeah, and then another question that I have based on um, uh, based on the the friction that the standing paper that you used. So. Did you use different manufacturer P80 sanding papers and did you find any uh, like... Yeah, so here violation? we did uh, a measure it over here. Yeah. So I did look at different um, uh, sanding paper and I saw that although they described sanding paper as um, a P80 is so many grains per inch, I think, um, it's it's not really the same for 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 different manufacturers because you also get different material they use for the um, sandpaper. Um, so we saw that the P I think there was P80 sandpaper which is a VMS RTK 700, and the P80 sandpaper from uh, Klingspor. Uh, although the the grid rating is the same it's it's totally different you cannot compare the two the one the one is super coarse it will take the nail take the nail of your finger if you rub on it and the other one uh, looks like cement it's nice and smooth um, and that the nice and smooth one actually gives you better results and more representative results um, than the one with the, all the sharp edges on it uh, so yeah definitely we looked at different sand, sandpaper um, I, I couldn't uh, plot all of the graphs because there's so many graphs, um, you'll get a bit destroyed <laughs> and there's not enough colors <laughs> to, to describe all of them. Uh, but yeah, we, did, we definitely looked at different uh, sandpaper um, and that, that definitely makes a, a big difference in what you use. Um, I see we have another question in the uh, Q&A section if you Let's maybe see. want to have a look at that we some i hope you're well it's good to see to hear from you uh, if you want you can actually ask it in in, in person but let me read it uh, nowadays twills are getting more momentum in small machines yeah, i've seen that uh, as well as uh, electrification so how do twill tires compare to traditional air cushion tires well that's twills will just have a constant um uh, what of how could it be? a constant uh, inflation pressure if you want to put it that way uh, whereas a, a normal tire that you can um, inflate you can change the stiffness a bit whereas a twill is a set thing you can't change it live with it <laughs> um, but your twills are getting getting big um, our, we also saw that uh, you not you don't necessarily win by changing the uh, inflation pressure when you're driving on asphalt terrain so a twill a twill should react uh, similar to a, an, an air cushion tire. Uh, I think the tire manufacturers also um, do a lot of research uh, which they don't publish and you can only find that out if you know uh, someone personal at uh, a tire manufacturer um, 
and they also they they won't tell you anything that they do because <laughs> industrial espionage. Um, but yeah, I think the tire manufacturers do a lot of lot of work on tires. Um, it's just if you see. Uh, if you look at the pressure distribution, uh, if you run at the right inflation pressure as they prescribed, your your pressure distribution is very nice and, and, and even in the tire. Um, and that all, they can't just uh, thumb suck uh, that. They've, I'm sure they do a lot of lot of testing, which I just don't publish. Or it's, or it's in French or German that we can't read. <laughs> um, I've noticed that. Uh, I think there's a lot of research out there that's not published in English. And that's a bit difficult for for the rest of the world to get access to. Uh, so yeah, I would actually like to have a, a tweel tested. So um, we some, if you want to have a test done on that uh, uh, tweel tire, please pop me a mail. It will be super interesting. All right. Uh, thanks. Anything else? I can't see anything what? else. I think hmm. I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat either. So, okay, but uh, it was very nice to do this, and uh, I hope I can uh, get some information out to you once we've done the, those additional tests. Uh, that'll be quite quite interesting. Yeah, and as soon as those papers of yours are published, then we will add uh, references to them to this video, uh, the YouTube video okay. that will be published later on the resource initiative notion webpage for the ISCVS. So if anyone mm -hmm. wants, they can, they can have a look at that then and um, they can communicate. No. So uh, my, my thesis will also be available on the uh, UP's um, uh, repository. So we can add that link as well. If, should anyone be interested? We'll do that. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So I think that is it um i don't think there's anything else that we any other questions that we have so thanks again a lot carl for the presentation it was really interesting um i think we we drew in a big crowd so i think a lot of people found it interesting and um enjoyed the presentation so thanks I again so. and in the future we will call you again as soon as you you get some new results and something cool to show us yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks. Thank you to everyone who, who listened to this and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And again, if you have any questions, just pop me a mail. All and right. if you want to use the data to parameterize your own models, definitely send me a mail. All right. Uh, okay. Thanks, Cole, for the presentation. So just a few uh, concluding remarks. So as I mentioned, the, this video will be uploaded to the ISDVS YouTube channel. We have a um, we have a playlist there from all the previous digital event series that we hosted. So if anyone would like to go and view any of the other talks that we had, uh, I refer you to that. Um, I think in the chat, yeah, Moet posted the link, so you can follow that link, or you can just go on YouTube and search for uh, International Society for Terrain Vehicle Systems. Then you should find the um, the channel and then you can go and view any of the other videos. Um, also, if there's any of the any of the participants that would like to contribute or um, view the resource initiative website, the, the website is also currently on the page. So you can view that website if there's any uh, resources that might interest you um, and also someone that you can connect with. Um, and I think that's all that I have to say. Uh, thanks for all the participants. Thanks, Carl. And um, thanks, Moet, in the background for helping with uh, um, the messages. And yeah, that's it from my side. Well, keep safe and see you all soon. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.